welcome to Secure Penetration Testing Operations, Demonstrated Weaknesses in Learning Materials and Tools. You are in the Mandalay Bay EF room, so if you're not in the correct room, please exit towards the back. The name of your speaker today is Wesley McGrew. Uh, before we begin, a few brief notes. Stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB during the day and, and for the welcome reception from 1730 to 1900 tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level three. And join us for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay, BCD at 1830. And thank you for putting your phone on vibrate. That makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore it while you wait for it to go to voicemail. And uh, also there are six microphones, I believe six, uh, scattered around the room. So when we do get to Q&A, if you could please kindly step up to one of the microphones so that we can all hear your question, that would greatly help. And without further ado, Wesley. Thank you so much. So I appreciate y'all coming out for this. Uh, so the, the interesting thing about this talk is that it was uh, it's probably the most difficult one I've had to put together. And it, if, uh, it's pre if you sort of look into this and you sort of look into the, the white paper that's behind this work uh, and some of the previous talks that I've given on the subject of penetration testing security, uh, you'll probably understand why. And so a lot of the people who are here today in attendance are penetration testers, or authors of books, or training material, trainers, uh, or you have recently taken a class here at Black Hat or at Sands or something like that, uh, and you're getting started in penetration testing. In any of those cases, you have a stake in this. And so it's very different from these other talks where we're breaking things and we're talking about people who aren't in the room. We're talking about people who uh, the, the faceless developers at some random company, the software you found the vulnerabilities in, the hardware that you found vulnerabilities in, it's a more difficult thing to talk about when it's us and when we're being introspective about this industry. But I think it's something that we have to do to improve things. And so that's why this talk is the third one in a series of talks I've given on secure penetration testing. This one is specifically on the learning material that we use to train penetration testers, uh, the, the, the tools that we use, the reference material we use, and the standards we follow. So for, for myself, uh, Wesley McGrew, uh, I'm the co-founder of Horn Cyber. So we founded Horn Cyber as the Halberd Group uh, last year, and we were acquired by Horn LLP, the accounting firm, and now we're a wholly owned subsidiary, and we primarily provide advanced penetration testing services. Uh, we provide some vulnerability analysis, incident response, things like that. But one of our main focuses is on, is on offensive security and doing that in a way that brings value to clients. And so uh, in this time uh, doing penetration tests as Horn Cyber, uh, we've noticed a lot of uh, insecure practices being carried out by previous penetration testing teams. Uh, at Horn Cyber, I'm the director of cyber operations. I'll lead the offensive engagements as well as research and development into tools. And I still teach at Mississippi State University. You might have seen me speak before uh, with that as sort of my banner. Uh, I'm part-time there now. So I still teach a class a semester. Still, still a great school to go to. I'm just across the street in Horn. So the situation at a glance for advanced penetration testing in and the state of penetration testing in general uh, is that it's not a very mature field yet. People have been doing this for some time now, a couple decades or so now, but it's still not a mature field. Uh, the main problem that I've identified with this uh, as far as problems that this can pose for the penetration test or pose for the clients is that these insecure practices used on these penetration tests put clients and penetration testers alike at risk. And we're going to talk about these things. Uh, the penetration testers and targets, uh, are, and penetration testers and clients, rather, clients, targets, what's the difference, right? Uh, during and between engagements, they're both attractive soft targets for third party attackers. There's a, there's a high motivating factor to attack 
a company that's undergoing a penetration test or to attack a penetration tester directly. And it's my belief and my findings through this research that the root cause of this problem is a lack of awareness. Uh, we simply don't introspect into ourselves. We don't, we're not introspective about how we do our testing, how we, uh, how we carry out of our, how we carry out our own operations. Uh, and the mat learning materials that we have for training new penetration testers and to serve as a reference for existing penetration testers, they teach insecure practices. And it's done for the sake of convenience for a learning environment because you don't have a realistic target environment. You don't have uh, time necessarily for all the, the intricate details of making sure that your command and control is secure. Uh, and so you cut corners. But unfortunately, that winds up being the model that testers use once they actually go out and perform real engagements. And so all of this has to change. Uh, and and that's that's just the 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 ultimate statement for this talk is that this has to change, otherwise there are going to be breaches because of this, because of the penetration testing that's going on. So the topics we're covering today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the previous and current work in this field that I've done. Uh, I presented a couple times at DEF CON on this topic. Uh, and so some of you may have seen those presentations online or in person. Uh, I'll briefly cover what those are about. I'm going to talk a, very briefly again about the threats involved, sort of the threat model of the third party attacker. I won't spend a lot of time on that because again I've covered that in the previous talks. I'm going to talk about the role of learning and reference material, why the, why there, there is a um, uh, a problem with uh, the, the, the depth of which learning material goes into this topic and why a lack of addressing these security issues in that learning material can lead to penetration testers doing this insecurely. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the study and this is a really interesting study so I took a, a large portion of books and training materials and standards and asked a series of questions about them about the types of uh, security issues they addressed or didn't address, what kind of practices they were teaching. And I'll talk to you about some of those findings. Uh, I'm going to recommend some best practices moving forward. And, uh, and just for fun, because I can't get on stage in Vegas without doing some sort of demo hacking something, uh, even though this study really isn't about that. Uh, just as a demonstration, a proof of concept of the types of third party attacks that can happen. I'll show you how to hijack interpreter sessions off the wire uh, if you're in a position to do so. And uh, finally, just a sort of call to action as to how we can how we can make this uh, make penetration testing great again, right? Uh, how we can uh, how we can turn this into a more secure practice and a better practice for our clients and ourselves. The two previous talks on this subject, I presented these at DEF CON 21 and 23. Uh, in between there, there was a, at 22, there was something, some kind of Wi-Fi pineapple thing going on. Uh, <laughs> so this work, however, this, this builds upon them. In those previous works, the first one, Pwn the Pwn Plug, was really a forensics talk. It was, um, the question was, is if you have these implantable devices, if you're leaving behind your pen testing Dropbox, your Pony Express device, your pineapple, your whatever, and you have this thing as uh, something that's monitoring things, giving you a pivot point into a client network. Uh, what kind of problems arise from that? How do you, what if a third party attacker were to find that in the same physical location? Uh, or if you're just a straight up bad guy, what happens when uh, the opposing force, the, the target, actually finds that device? Can they analyze that device and extract sensitive information from it about the client or about you? Um, and what are the vulnerabilities in that? And that one I demonstrated a vulnerability that was current to the uh, pawn plug at the time uh, that would allow from a single network packet uh, a command injection into the device itself. Uh, with iHunt penetration testers, uh, I looked at tools and so I did a survey of Kali tools and their default configurations and then demonstrated some uh, vulnerabilities in those. And this one, the question is, is why is this a problem? Why, why is it that uh, 
even when we have tools that can be used securely, why are we not using them securely? And so uh, in this I have a paper and a talk, so the white paper will be available on our website uh, uh, right now, I believe, and also on the Black Hat uh, briefing site. And so I'd really encourage you to dig into that. I really don't download the slides, download the paper, right? Get something you can sink your teeth into. But the idea here is to recommend some change. So why is it that the compromise of a penetration tester is attractive? If you're a penetration tester sitting in this audience right now, you probably already know why. You carry around some very sensitive information on the devices you carry with you, uh, over the network connections you use during engagements and in your own uh, network environment. And so for the, uh, so for, for you, uh, the idea is all of this data that's out there, um, all this data that you have is sensitive and, it, and compromising you means a compromise of so many of your clients at the same time. And so uh, your information is valuable. You might have a, a stockpile of uh, vulnerability information. So we have, in the course of our engagements, we find vulnerabilities in products, and not all of that's public knowledge. We don't we don't publicly disclose all of those. Well, if you break into our systems, well, then you have all of that. Um, if you are the uh, if you're the target for this, so that's your intellectual property. The tools, tactics, tactics, and procedures you use are a big deal as well. But also to use you to compromise your clients is a big deal. So uh, it provides great operational cover for a third party attacker. If you're that nation state, you're that organized crime threat that wants to hack into one of your clients during your penetration test, all sorts of strange things happen in the pen test. I make myself available 24 seven to our clients uh, via my cell phone so that if something strange happens on their network, if they notice something, they can call me up and determine very quickly whether it's us or not, and sometimes it's not us. It's a third party. It's a it's an attacker that's all that's also live on the network alongside us. Uh, you don't want a situation where the client assumes that everything's fine, even though alarm bells are going off because the pen test is going on. Because as penetration testers, we're expected to break rules. We're expected to attack things, elevate privileges, exfiltrate data, and so if somebody else is doing that at the same time, using our command and control channels that becomes a serious problem. And we've noticed this. So on a recent engagement, uh, within 15 minutes of starting this engagement with this very large company, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of Class C subnets, first 15 minutes, the first thing I find is a Windows XP machine responding on SNMP with a uh, process list, right? You can turn this on. It's interesting to see, but uh, Windows XP machine dumping process list to you via SNMP. And that was a finding in and of itself, of course, but one of the processes that I noticed was a Java version of the Meterpreter agent running. And it was running in, in, as a listener. And so you could connect to this thing uh, with, with Meterpreter and control the system. It's already there. The, it was already on, pre-owned for me, right? And it turned out that that had been in place for at least eight months due to the previous penetration testing firm that tested this client. They had left that there for that long. And so that's the sort of thing that, that's a problem and that opens up vulnerabilities and there are threats that will take advantage of those. There's no standard for penetration testing. This is the cause and effect here. So the cause here is that there's no standard for it. There are, you know, there's pentest.standard.org, there's the PCI recommendations for penetration testing, um, all that. And I'll get a little bit cut off at the bottom there, but don't worry about it. Uh, the, the, uh, the problem with this is that uh, everything we do is very ad hoc. And I'm not sure that we could ever really standardize on a process for penetration testing. It's meant to be human driven, it's meant to be team based, it's meant to be uh, dependent on your experience, intuition, your pattern recognition. I don't know that it's ever something that you should automate, so don't, right? Uh, and, so, and so that's great that we're very dynamic in the way we do testing, uh, but the trade off there, the problem is, is when we're not flexible, when we're not uh, adapting to the situation and being aware of our environment, we're not necessarily using encrypted command and control. We're not using strong practices for making sure that we're only ones, the only ones on the system. And so there's a, there's a trade-off here. There should be standards for that sort of thing, but we have to trade off between our flexibility that gives 
penetration test value and the rigor that's required to make sure that they're done properly. We operate as we learn in this field, so we use the tools, techniques, and procedures that we, uh, that we, oh, Wi-Fi network's available, yes, I, I definitely want to join that. Uh, turn off your pineapples. Uh, so it, we, in our training, we, we learn procedures for breaking into things, procedures for controlling systems remotely, procedures for exfiltrating data, and we will usually just reuse those pr exact procedures on real engagements. That's, that's how we, that's why we operate. You will develop some on your own operationally and, and as you gain experience and the, the better you are at this, the more you're developing your own procedures and honing this process. But uh, there are a lot of penetration testers that simply don't. They just do what they've learned from their books, from their training. And it's because the lowest common denominator for this is profit. You can do the least penetration, the least possible thing that can still be called penetration testing and still get paid the same amount. And, you know, we bang our heads against this, right? Because we want to provide that value. We want to, to find the vulnerabilities that others aren't. We want to find the, the organization specific vulnerabilities that they're not in the automated tools. Uh, and so there's a difficult problem there. So there's no formal requirement for starting in this, nor should I, th I think that there should be. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have to have a computer science degree for, or, you know, weeks or months of training to, to be a penetration tester. I'm not advocating for that. But, uh, but without those requirements, it's tough to set a standard for it. And there's no testing requirement either, other, unless you count, like, multiple choice tests, you're right. And so there's some, uh, some, uh, of the different uh, training programs and the, t and the certification programs that also involve uh, uh, practical tests, and that's a good idea. And so, you know, look for those people who are who are who are passing those. And so, for convenience and expediency, our testing processes follow the training that we provide. Uh, and so, the, the 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 this so this is the effect of it, right? And so, the, the re the, with the result of us relying so much on this training and tool and the training and the learning material to do this is uh, to get started in penetration testing. There's a lower depth and breadth of technical knowledge required to get going with this. You know, the best penetration testers we have are people who are experienced systems administrators, experienced network administrators that have a depth of experience with a lot of different systems. Uh, we have testers that are very good because they come from a software development background, and so they know how. They know how code works and they know how to find vulnerabilities in it. And that's a lot better than simply, uh, you know, starting from scratch. And I'm all about being, people being able to get started in this field. However, they need to have a good amount of technical knowledge. And then there's a lack of situational awareness in your secure operation and communication. So there's no instruction and there's no guidance and there's no practice surrounding being aware of when I launch this exploit, when I set up this command and control channel to the target system, uh, is that over an encrypted channel? Who can see that? Is it simply that I'm one hop away from the server and somebody would have to be on this local subnet to see it? Or is it that I'm launching this attack across the public internet and I don't know, trace route and see how many possible places are there that you could see this? You know, we don't trust... Uh, we don't trust the systems we use for social networking and email to run over unencrypted channels, uh, and so, uh, or to an extent we do, but as little as possible, we fuss about it, right? If a site doesn't support HTTPS, we raise hell about it, right? And, uh, but, but uh, we don't necessarily hold our own tools and processes to the same standards. So the study for the the study for this uh, talk, the goal of this is to answer the question: How are secure practices and penetration tested in covered or not covered in learning and reference materials? Intuitively, you know, I've read all of these books, right? And so I, I read these things as I come out. I'm a reader, and so some of you have probably read all of them too, uh, or at least read some of them, and it's how you learn to do what you're doing. And so you probably already know the answer to this question is that they're not, right? Intuitively, I know, knew getting into this, that they're, they're not covering this. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a difficult thing to do to point out this as a flaw. Uh, and so I looked at books, training material that's freely available, and uh, standards documents uh, for any kind of reference to these problems. 
the uh, books were selected from just simply top Amazon results. So you can get a pretty ex exhaustive list of, of learning material that people use to get started in this field by just going to Amazon, searching for penetration testing, sorting by the most popular books, and going through a few pages, removing the uh, removing the uh, the false positives. There's some that just just don't make any sense for the search. <coughs> There's also some books that will trigger on hits for penetration testing, but when you really dig into them, they're not really penetration testing books. Uh, they may be a book on, on how to use a specific product or something like that. Uh, and then with the training, uh, the idea is to look at publicly available material. Only three of these were selected on this, and so this is a notably a very limited part of the study. Uh, didn't look at commercial products for this uh, commercial training because of non-disclosure agreements associated with those things, the cost associated with, with getting that material and you know even if I paid for the material it doesn't mean that I can start disclosing things about it for a study. And then four different standards. Uh, you know uh, I don't really disclose what all of these are but things like the PCI and the pentest.standard.org for those. The uh, the key for for and in, in, in the selection of this, and you'll notice that uh, that that I don't disclose the names of these books, and it's really because it's there the not not any no book really did very well on this uh, on this study, and this talk is not meant to be a call out to specific authors by name or specific titles of books or training classes or standards by name. Uh, while, while it's important that everybody realize that moving forward we need to make more material that, that addresses this better, uh, it's, this is not meant to be like a call out session or to, to create an amount of drama surrounding that that, uh, that overshadows the main point of this. Uh, and that's part of why when I opened this up I talked about how difficult this particular study was to do and how I knew creating this to present here that this would be uh, uh, potentially a controversial thing. So for each of those uh, pieces of material I asked a set of questions and I've got a slide per each of them. And the first question is uh, is just, and we have you know a basic overall part of it in the question itself, and this is host security for the penetration tester. So does the work address precautions for preventing penetration tester systems from being compromised? And the one caveat that I had for this question when I analyzed a piece of material to see if it had if it addressed this concern was I did not count it if they told you to change the Cali password away from T O O R. Uh, almost everybody at least gets that, but I just uh, it's just not good enough, right? And that's 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 a good first step. Do that, but uh, but that's not really addressing this. And so, uh, how do we make sure that the system itself doesn't get compromised? And then host security for the client. So we have talked about for the testing systems. What about the client? So does the work address precautions for maintaining the security of client systems during the test? So. During the penetration test, do my uh, are the actions that I'm taking against that client system leave it open for anybody to compromise it? So, needless to say, there's going to be that vulnerability there that I use to get in, and uh, somebody could easily exploit the same vulnerability to get in. But am I uh, am I leaving back doors in place? Am I uh, 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 do I have a process for making sure that that I don't start back up on a on a reboot, such that you know there's a likelihood that that malware, that command and control, stays there after the after the test is over with, like we saw on a recent test. So, uh, are we addressing those concerns? Communication security. So, this is uh, sort of when we're talking about scoping with a client, when we're talking about that, that thing where or the client can call me up at any time to, to get a sanity check on was this you. Uh, when we provide our results, when we generate our report, when we write our reports and we send that to the client, is all of that being done securely? That report is usually pretty explosive when we send that, right? So there's a lot of very interesting information in those reports that a lot of people would want to see. Uh, are we addressing that whenever we uh, whenever we talk to the client? 
And so are we encrypting that? Are we using some sort of a, one of our own like HTTPS Dropbox type systems, not literally Dropbox, but the, uh, the like a file sharing service that's encrypted so that they can get at that. Uh, can we even set up PGP keys? That would be nice, right? If we could, if we could use uh, email encryption to handle this problem, but often the client isn't well prepared to engage in that. So client data in transit. This is during the test. So when we're we we, we proof of concept our our, uh, our exploits, right? We we our 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 findings. We want to determine the impact of those findings. That's as important as pointing out what the problem is. Point out what the problem is. Point out how bad it's going to hurt, so that somebody can make a decision as to what are we going to patch. What are we going to do first? Well, we're going to fix the things that are easiest to fix that have the highest impact. And so in the process of proving that impact, we, uh, we exfiltrate data from the client to show, well, we can get customer records from this. We can get uh, domain admin uh, credentials, password databases, that sort of thing out of a system uh, in the process of doing this. And that, that drives the point home. But if we're doing that, are we bringing that to our systems in a secure way? Are we doing it over the public internet over a netcat shell, that's a problem, right? So does this work address this transmission of client data? And then client data at rest. So on our systems, uh, how are we protecting it? So the, the data is sitting on, on our local systems, on our network uh, during the test. Uh, is it in a form that anybody can get at? How do we maintain access control over it? This is something that a lot of people don't think about. Your operational security when you're doing your open source intelligence gathering. So uh, your first phase of a penetration test is probably to see what information is publicly available uh, about the system, uh, about the, the client systems, their organization. How, what can you find from uh, job listings? What can you find on Pastebin about them? Uh, that sort of thing. The problem is, it's when you're doing that open source intelligence gathering, you wind up uh, you, you you wind up possibly revealing a little too much about your client, right? And so uh, if you're so some people say, oh, do these sorts of things over Tor, so it's non-attributable, or you're doing it over Tor because you're searching some dark web sites for things. Well, the more specific you are with your search terms, the more you're disclosing who your client is to sites on the public internet. Or sites on tour, uh, and so while you're doing that, you know you're basically telegraphing to third parties that hey, X Y Z is doing a penetration test for ABC. So that's a that's a problem. So are you addressing those concerns? Uh, does the study the study asks for each piece of material? Does the work address potential threats? So does the work address even or even acknowledge the uh, the idea that there could be a third party attacker looking at a system uh, that you're currently testing or looking at your system or looking at your traffic? Uh, so does it address issues with conducting tests over hostile networks? And so the ho hostile network. The best, the, the the most hostile network is the public internet, right? Uh, unencrypted wireless networks. Uh, so, does it address your position on the, the public internet versus the client's position on the public internet in such a way that you're figuring out, well, possibly not. Let's not do this kind of test remotely over the public internet. Let's at least set up a VPN to them. Let's do it on site. Let's do something different rather than uh, exploiting systems over the internet where others can see. And this one's in red because it's actually a reverse type question right here. It's a, if this is answered yes, then that's a bad thing. Uh, insecure practices. Does the work demonstrate or teach at least one example of an insecure practice without describing how it might leave the tester or the client vulnerable? And so it's okay if you, if you disclose, if you talk about setting up the netcat shell is the best example of this, right? I, uh, netcat shell over the public internet. With, with a bash prompt on the other end of it or a command prompt on the other end of it. Uh, you know, that's the classic, you know, you see this in every piece of material instance of this. Uh, that's fine as long as, you know, somewhere near that you're saying, you know what, this might be a bad idea uh, uh, if you're doing this over uh, networks where you don't control everything. 
So if there's third parties on this network, maybe that's a that maybe that's a poor idea. Uh, so does that is that addressed by the material? And so this is a matrix here of the results here. So uh, down the y-axis there you have the resource numbers. Uh, these are randomized. Uh, they're not alphabetical order or anything like that where you could figure out what they were, right? But you can see that this thing, it's mostly bad, right? Uh, and across the x-axis you have the different questions. Host security penetration test or host security client, communication security, client data in transit, data at rest, uh, you know, if this is hard to read, and I'm, I'm sure it is, it was hard to figure out how to format this for the for the screen. Uh, uh, this is in the white paper, and so you can really dig into this in the white paper and see what's up. Uh, there's a few, there's a few notes about this. One, you see, this is mostly red. Uh, most most uh, most material doesn't don't address any of these issues. Uh, I would say most of them are red all the way across. You'll notice that for the insecure practices, the colors are inverted for Y and N. Uh, since yes, I covered insecure practices is a bad thing in this instance. Uh, the two yellow ends on insecure practices uh, were they they passed by virtue of not having uh, uh, of of not covering practices. Uh, the books were in those cases, or the material in those cases were uh, sort of procedural in nature, uh, a standard or a book that, that covers things from a, a sort of a management type perspective and not necessarily uh, the nuts and bolts of actually exploiting systems. Uh, and so that's why those were in. Uh, so you'll see that there's, you know, most books did not cover any of this. So out of 24 works, 14 did not address any of the issues. So the majority of them didn't address any of these questions. Uh, only four pieces of material addressed more than two issues. So every work that actually covered technical practices described actions that were potentially dangerous or insecure. Every one of them was a yes for that with the caveat that, uh, that, that, that one of them warned about doing these things over on encrypted networks. The most common flaw in this case is, as I've been talking about, unencrypted command and control. Uh, Netcat, web shells, default interpreter agents. Uh, these things that we normally use because we're mimicking our, we're, we're, we're patterning in our attacks after what we see real attackers doing. Uh, real attackers may or may not be doing this securely. They don't care as much as we do, right? And so if we're patterning what we do after what they're doing, then we in turn don't do this securely. And so this is, this is the fun part of the talk right here. And without disclosing the actual material itself, although if you're clever with, with searching and, and digging through material, you'll, you'll find out what, which books and which materials these were. Uh, I have a, a few greatest hits here for examples of the most insecure practices presented in the work study. And these are things that just really stood out to me, things that when I was taking my notes for this I really, you know, stood up and took note of. And for these, uh, I have a different, so I'm giving this talk at DEF CON as well on Saturday. I'll have a different set of these for that in case you're really bored and you want to see this talk again, you can see a different set of these. So this this one is just a, a, a a very uh, common uh, uh, issue here. This is a variation on the sort of netcat reverse shell, netcat open up a shell type thing. In this case, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a payload. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Simotha. I'd never used it before personally, but I've seen uh, but I saw it you know covered in several of these pieces of material. And in this case, this is talking about after compromising a system, uh, installing this uh, payload on the system. I guess the benefit of this one being that it can inject into another process and listen for you. The the key here is that this one is uh, this is something that runs on a system, and a lot of these do this. It runs on a system and it listens for a connection. That's far more dangerous. E so. It, all these things over unencrypted networks, unencrypted channels or over unencrypted networks are dangerous anyways, but having one listen on a socket for anybody to connect to is a problem, right? 
and so uh, or even more of a problem. And so in this case, uh, not being familiar with this, I didn't really know what you would use to talk to it after it, after it gets set up, but later on it talks about, well, we can log into it by netcatting to that port. And so it's a dumb client for it. It just takes a terminal to be a, a client for this piece of uh, payload. And this is functionally identical to the meterpreter agent that you that you use. Like, as far as this talk is concerned, it's obviously meterpreter is more advanced. But uh, but even meterpreter and its default configurations don't address these. The difference is is that the people who develop Metasploit and develop meterpreter realize this, and they have documentation about the the problems with default meterpreter, and they have a mechanism for for uh, making it more secure. This one is hilarious. Uh, and so this piece of material, uh, I know some of you are going to know what this is from. Uh, they have a set of, uh, they have a section on using proxies and penetration testing. And, uh, and I've taken steps two through four. Step one, I don't even remember what it was, but it wasn't important. But step two was to enter proxies into your favorite search engine to find a site providing a list of publicly available proxies. Each proxy in the list contains an IP address and a port. Randomly select a proxy from the list and write down that IP address and port. And in your browser, find the proxy settings and manually configure your browser to use the information from step three. And now, you know, go to town, right? Do whatever you want to do at that point. Uh, the problem with this is you don't know who's running those proxies. Probably not nice people, right? So, uh, and so you're literally making sure by this that you are doing your attacks across a network that is untrusted and, it, and probably is actively untrusted, actively hostile to you. And they had a note there, and, and they're, they're literally saying that on a test, choose a proxy outside the United States to best simulate what an advanced attacker would do. And uh, proxies based in the United States can have their records subpoenaed, which is why a malicious party typically would refrain from using them. So they're telling you to actively seek out proxies in other countries to route your attacks through. This is not something that you should be doing on a legitimate penetration test. Uh, this, this is another proxy one. This one is, uh, talk, again, talking about uh, uh, searching for public proxy lists. Uh, this one actually addresses it, right? And the administrators of proxies can see all traffic as well as identify both targets and victims that communicate. We highly recommend that you research any proxy prior to using it, as some might use information captured without your permission. I don't know how you conduct this research. I don't know how you determine what they're doing with it. I guess if it's a Tor exit node, then you can pretty, be pretty sure that they are. Uh, this includes providing for forensic evidence to authorities or selling your sensitive information. Why, as a penetration tester, are you concerned about the uh, the pro proxy turning over forensic evidence to authorities. This hits on a very core issue that you see in a lot of penetration testing books uh, and, and other kind of book-like material is that in some cases penetration testing in books is a code word for here's how to hack into things. And so all of them have the disclaimers about, you know, use this in a well-scoped penetration test, but, but when you actually read the material and the processes that they're recommending, it becomes clear that these books target people who just want to buy the books to learn how to hack into stuff uh, without permission, necessarily. And so, and, and so things like that, sometimes it bubbles up to the surface in, uh, in these texts. This one is... Uh, to is to is basically encouraging you that if you uh, if you get a, a hash value out of a web app or or a system and you need to crack that hash, don't bother setting up your own uh, cluster for this. Don't don't have your own rainbow tables. Use an online one ran by who knows, right? And so you submit your hash to something like this md5decryptor.co.uk. Maybe the guys uh, running that are really nice. Maybe they're totally uh, mindful about this and they throw these, throw these things away. Uh, maybe they're not logging what IP addresses are asking for. I mean, overall, you know, uh, it's a little bit of a leap to go from there for a compromise to the client because they don't know where that hash came from necessarily. But why are you giving it to them, right? Why encourage, you know, disseminating that out like that? 
And then this one, uh, this one uh, uh, was wild, right? And so this is talking about using uh, uh, Zigbee radios to uh, have command and control. And so that's kind of out of band itch, right? You know, uh, most people aren't really looking for those kinds of uh, 802, 15, 4 networks going on. Uh, and so it's a little bit different from doing your Wi-Fi, different from doing your over the public internet stuff. And so from that, uh, you know, the, the, the benefit there is range. But, you know, if you do this, you can encrypt the network, but the text actually recommended that you just start encrypting all, it just said to it, uh, uh, you may be tempted to encrypt all the traffic, but don't because it makes things slow, <laughs> right? Uh, and then talks about doing penetration tests from miles away for this. And so think of the attack surface you've opened up there. As far as recommendations for this are concerned, the idea here is uh, to encourage people to use good client communication security. Basically the answer yes to all these questions or no to the last one about insecure practices. To make the boxes green on this. So moving forward, the material we use has to do this. It has to address your situational awareness. You have to understand the attacks that you're launching well enough to know what the exposure is. And that will probably require there to be a higher bar of entry to being able to learn how to do penetration testing. If you have to be this aware or this smart about these threats to conduct a secure real penetration test, you know, that raises the bar a little bit on, on entry to this field. And that might just have to be what happens, right? And so the demonstration, this tool's released along with the black hat materials that'll be on the site uh, later on. Uh, this is Snag Interpreter. This is demonstrating hijacking uh, HTTP and HTTPS interpreter sessions. So you can play around with this. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the interpreters, that's your most commonly used and documented uh, implant. Uh, it's easy to use, popular. Uh, it's often used operationally across untrusted networks. Uh, but the encryption provided by the HTTPS version of the interpreter is not meant to provide security for your communication. It's meant to provide an intrusion detection uh, evasion. So it's meant for evasion. The developers of Mesploit, they know this, and there's documentation on how to set these things up in what's called a paranoid mode. Validates those certificates, so, but it's more of a pain to actually set up. And nobody teaches you how to do this other than the official documentation. So what I've got here is my demonstration. We've got three systems rolling here. We've got a penetration tester, and a penetration tester is sitting here waiting for incoming connections uh, on its IP address. Oops. It's waiting for an interpreter agent to phone in, an HTTPS reverse handler. We have our client over here that's going to run the link to Wesley McGrew's docs on pastebin, not .exe at all. And we have the third party attacker who is sitting with a similar uh, situation also waiting on a interpreter agent to show up. And so when we run this totally innocuous EXE, and this is the payload, right? So this payload would execute as, uh, you know, the payload to an exploit or as a phishing attempt or something like that. It shows up on the penetration tester system and the penetration tester has command and control over the target system. The snag interpreter tool, you provided an interface, a target IP address, so the, the, the client's system, the listener, the, uh, the, uh, the penetration tester's system's IP address, and the listener's port, and a port on your local system that you want to forward that shell to. And it's really very simple. It sets up a man in the middle attack uh, sets up a simple ARP spoofing attack, though any man in the middle attack that you're uh, comfortable doing, any time you're on a network position to do these sorts of things, uh, you, can, you can, sorry, launch these things. We're going to run this. Yeah. <laughs> and so we start spoofing there, and in a second, boom, now we have the interpreter shell as the third party attacker. And so this third party attacker now has control over the interpreter session. 
the, uh, the penetration tester doesn't see anything on their screen. If they try to issue a command right now, it won't work, it'll hang. Uh, once we stop the man in the middle attack, it'll get passed back to the penetration tester. Usually with no interruption of service. As long as, unless the timing on this is really bad, yeah. So it went back to the penetration tester, never knew anything was wrong. You could automate this attack. You could detect the sessions, you could inject something into that session and then pass it back to the pen tester before they even realized it. Uh, and so, going back to the slides here, the conclusion for this is penetration tester, test thyself. Look at your processes so that you know what the problems are. And so you can't have this both ways. You can't report on vulnerabilities in situations involving malicious actors intercepting and modifying traffic uh, while ignoring that same threat model in your operations. And so we have to improve these things. And that's the sound bites for this really. The, the, the core points of this is that we're putting ourselves and clients at risk Third party malicious attackers can take advantage of it. The root cause is the learning material and the way we learn to do these things. And direct and mindful action has to be taken in order to solve this problem. And so with that, the materials will be available on our new attack surface blog. And we have uh, about three or four minutes for questions if you'll just come to the microphones. All right, so if we don't have any questions, uh, I'm also willing to, to go offline with you on it. And so, uh, so thank you for attending this, and I hope that it helps you be a little more introspective about your testing. Thank you.